Colonel Hodges, it's great to have you on CNBC. Thank you so much for joining us. I just want to get your assessment of where we are today in terms of Ukraine's pushback of Russian forces. So I believe that Ukrainian forces have achieved irreversible momentum. There's, there's no going back. Uh, it's too early to uh, start planning victory parades. Uh, there's still a lot of really hard fighting to go. Thousands more people are going to die, uh, probably murdered by Russian forces firing into residential areas again. Um, but it, it feels like, well, in fact, I'm sure that we are at the point now where there's no going back. I expect that Ukraine will push Russian forces back to the 23 February line by the end of this year and that they will have uh, liberated Crimea by next summer, 2023. What does a negotiated peace in your mind look like today, given what you just said? Well, of course, there, there should be no pressure on Ukraine to negotiate anything, uh, perhaps other than how fast the Russians can take down that big bridge over the Kerch Strait. Um, I don't know how we can press Ukraine to give up or let Russia keep any Ukrainian territory since we know what happens to Ukrainians in Russian occupied territory. We, we've all seen that. Uh, why in the world would, should Putin be rewarded in any way, get any sort of victory out of this? And all this will do will result in another frozen conflict. And you and I will be talking next year about, well, what are we going to do about now is we, like Crimea, like Georgia. Exactly. Something. I mean, this started with Transnistria, Georgia, Crimea, Syria, and here we are, kind of at the end of a, another 30 years war, if you will. When you think about what happens next, there's been a suggestion um, by the Ukrainians that they would allow for U.S. oversight on Russian targets if they were to obtain another long-range missile system. Is that something that, in your view, the U.S. would even consider? Is that even legal? Well, uh, first let me say this. The administration has done a fantastic job. Uh, I mean, really, from a diplomatic standpoint, uh, the commitment to uh, helping Ukraine and, and keeping the allies together has been so, so important. The one place where I disagree with the administration is they stop short of saying we want Ukraine to win, and we're going to do everything necessary to help them win. And uh, this is because I think of a overestimation of the risk of escalation, of it going nuclear. And so the idea, we can't give Ukraine uh, ATACMs, for example, the extended range, because they might use them against targets inside Russia, which then dot, dot, dot. Um, I think Ukraine has made it clear, we won't do that. I mean, and that's easy for us to control. Um, so if, if Ukraine had ATACMs right now, they could be hitting tar Russian ships sitting in Sevastopol. I mean, that's exactly 300 kilometers from Odessa to Sevastopol. That's a, that's a capability that would, uh, I think, speed us towards a successful conclusion here. And speaking of that escalation, obviously the threat of nuclear action by the Kremlin has been something that everyone's been talking about over yeah. the last couple of weeks. Do you believe that's a credible threat? It's, it's absolutely a credible threat. Uh, they have thousands of nuclear weapons. Um, and President Putin obviously doesn't care about how many innocent people would get killed. But I still think it's unlikely that he would do it. Number one, there, there's no battlefield advantage to using a nuclear weapon for the Russians. In the Cold War, the Soviet doctrine was to use the tactical nuclear weapon to, to create a, a breach that then follow-on forces could go through and exploit it. There are no follow-on forces. I mean, there's nobody to go through. So if they use it against a city somewhere in Ukraine or troop concentration, it would kill several people several thousand people, perhaps, but it would give them no advantage. So they would get all the negative repercussions for doing that with no advantage. So I hope they don't make that terrible decision. Furthermore, they know that it would be impossible for the United States not to become directly involved. And that's the last thing they want. Our president, our, his national security advisor made it clear that, that would be a terrible mistake for Russia. The consequences would be devastating. And I imagine that the president would do things in consultation with allies. It would be proportional, and it would be done in such a way that doesn't automatically lead to a, a, a next round. But it would be very clear. And the Chinese are watching this. The North Koreans are watching this. The Iranians are watching this. This is why it's so important that we have to. We would have to respond. And finally, the people around Putin to keep him in power. 
they're the ones, that's the target of information. Say, hey, look, if you have any hope of life after Putin, of, of getting back to your oligarch lifestyle, then you will make sure that he never uses a nuclear weapon. I imagine that's being conveyed to them pretty clearly. In terms of the sanctions that we've seen um, from Western allies, NATO allies on Russia, do you believe that they have been enough? Do we need to look at more sanctions? I, well, I would imagine additional sanctions are on that list of options, that there are still other things that could be done. I'm actually quite pleased with uh, what the administration has done uh, on sanctions. We know that, for example, the Russians cannot replace any of the precision weapons they've been using because they depend on imported parts for Iskander missile, for example. So that, that has a positive battlefield effect as well as other aspects of their defense industry. Um, the people are beginning to feel it also, which is important. And I, I believe that the combination of endless catastrophes on the battlefield, this terribly bungled uh, partial mobilization and the domestic impact of sanctions, that's going to make it very, very difficult for the Kremlin to keep their population motivated to continue this conflict. How worried are you about European NATO member motivation? Because we're talking so much about the energy crisis and the potential, if there's a long, cold winter in Europe, for that to escalate. We're talking about energy poverty now. Yeah. So I live in Frankfurt, Germany, and um, I have been impressed over the last two or three months as I've watched the uh, public attitude change. First of all, the, the Kremlin played the gas card way too early. So people like Minister Habeck, uh, who's in charge of energy uh, for Germany, they had months to find alternative sources for the United States to respond, to do other things, and to build up storage capacity. I mean, they're over 90% now, which is well ahead of where they would typically be this time of year. Secondly, I've, I've sensed a growing resolve among German uh, bus business people that I interact with uh, frequently. I've, 74% of Germans are in favor of doing more to help Ukraine. I mean, this is significant. And so I'm much less worried about it now than I was two or three, two or three months ago. Um, and I would say also, uh, this is the last winter. I mean, this, is the la this will be the last winter that Russia can influence what we have to deal with in wintertime. I mean, people are finding other sources of energy. Humans adapt. I mean, we're, we're figuring it out. This, so if we think in terms of this is the last winter, we, we kind of have to gut it out. Uh, not just heat in our apartments, but for industry. It's going to force us uh, to do other things. I'm actually more worried that there are uh, many members, Republican members of the Congress, that are, why are we, why are we helping Ukraine? I mean, it's incredible to me that the party of Reagan uh, now are the most vocal, loudmouth supporters of what the Kremlin's doing. I, I don't understand that. When you think about the U.S. Congress uh, and the administration, frankly, in terms of supporting Europe in this energy crisis, do you think that they're going to have to get used to the fact that they're going to have to be spending more in order to ensure security in Europe? Look, uh, America's prosperity is directly tied to European prosperity. I mean, our biggest trading partners are the European Union. So even if not one European country spent one euro, pound, zloty, uh, or krona on defense, it's still in our interest that Europe is stable so that it, and secure so that it can be prosperous. So in the long run, this is actually a pretty small investment. I mean, if you think about there are about ish 100,000 U.S. Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines that are in Europe, permanent and rotate, 100,000. That's how many people fill up Michigan's football stadium. So we're not talking about a gigantic chunk of our defense. General, it's wonderful to have you on CNBC. Thank you for joining us. It was my privilege.